Here's the pathology. They're usually uh, a very dark red in appearance. It's been described as current jelly-like. This is a very large plasmacytoma involving the proximal portion of the humerus. Obviously, one in involving the femoral neck, relatively well-circumscribed lesion composed of sheets of plasma cells. Remember, plasma cells are the cell that produce immunoglobulins. The nuclei are eccentric. Cells have a lot of purple cytoplasm where the immunoglobulins are being produced. So the treatment of plasma cytoma, you shouldn't resect plasma cytomas unless they're resected because of it for a diagnosis reason. Plasma cytomas are treated predominantly with radiation, and certainly consider chemotherapy if the plasma cells uh, increase to a high, high enough percentage. Here's an example where the, most of the mid-diaphysis was gone with the plasma cytoma. We put a rod in, prophylactically fixed, radiated this thing, and this healed in quite nicely following treatment. Now, plasma cytoma, eventually, 60% of them will turn into multiple myeloma. Myeloma is a round cell disease, usually in the late middle ages, beginning around 40, and you see it predominantly around 70, age 60 and 70 years of age. There's a classic punched out holes you see in the skull, as you see in that x-ray there. One of the other presenting factors of multiple myeloma, they don't uncommonly get vertebral fractures because they get such significant osteoporosis changes because there's an inhibition of the osteoblastic function. So kyphoplasty is very common treatment for these vertebral fractures. Here's an example of a large multimyeloma with a soft tissue mass uh, treated uh, just with the chemotherapy and radiation, does not need any surgery for these. Here you can see a multimyeloma of the uh, long bones. You can see these punched out holes throughout the femur and proximal tibia. Um, we don't see this much disease progression in general anymore because of the bisphosphonates used with myeloma, and they really protect the bone much better now than we did previously. You rarely see these punched out holes in the skull. Again, the bisphosphonates have prevented most of this significant bone destruction. And in multiple myeloma, again, the lesions look similar to the, what we saw in plasma cytoma. The difference being here that there are multiple lesions with this large major one resulting in uh, a pathologic fracture. And again, histologically, uh, multiple myeloma, neoplasm of plasma cells, and they can demonstrate varying degrees of cytologic atypia. This example, very large, uh, bizarre uh, tumor cells. This is just a touch preparation uh, showing the histologic features of plasma cells with the perinuclear huff containing the uh, uh, Golgi, very uh, prominent uh, Golgi apparatus. There are a variety of different, again, molecular abnormalities associated with myeloma, and some of these individual ones are associated with different types of prognosis. So in many instances now, we're doing these sophisticated uh, um, uh, analyses to determine which translocation is present to determine, to give information about the prognosis and help understand which patients should undergo um, significant and intense systemic therapy, which can include a bone marrow transplant. Lymphoma bone. Um, uh, lymphoma bone, uh, previously I think it was called reticulum cell sarcoma bone. Yes. Um, and so we learn now it was lymphoma bone. Predominantly they occur uh, in the pelvic area. Um, although they occur, as you can see, from any area um, in any bone. But they occur a little bit younger age than the myeloma. When I'm thinking of a malignant round cell tumor, lymphoma is my mid-age tumor, whereas myeloma is my older one uh, patient and Ewing's my younger one. So lymphoma uh, of bone, um, I think that uh, it's, it's a very permanent appearance. You don't see any bone formation around the mineralization. You see these uh, permeative uh, lesions. Um, you don't often see like this pelvis area, such a, a well delineated area, but what you see is lesions in multiple bones with this lymphoma bone in this child. This is, I think, the characteristic, and we've just been studying the um, radiologic features of lymphoma bone, and this is really the classic appearance where there's a, a permanent appearance, and because 
um, they uh, push out the periosteum, you see some thickening of the bone there. But what's interesting is you see these small soft tissue masses associated with it here. You don't see the large soft tissue mass you see with Ewing sarcoma. And what's important about this picture is looking at the other bone. And you see this lymphoma bone doesn't uncommonly have multiple other bone lesions when you're reviewing it, the pathology. And grossly, they, look, they can look very similar to Ewing sarcoma. Here, medullary cavity filled with this tan flesh-like material. These regions here that are whiter represent areas of necrosis. This is a primary lymphoma of bone, which has undergone secondary pathologic fracture, resulting in all of the hemorrhage. Typical malignancy, they're growing with an infiltrative growth pattern. Lymphoma's bone is one of the tumors that can be difficult sometimes to get uh, adequate tissue on a needle biopsy specimen because of the secondary crush artifact that can affect the tumor cells resulting in smearing of the nuclei, making it very difficult to make a definitive diagnosis. Here though, the nuclei are preserved. Again, they are larger than the cells that we saw in the Ewing sarcoma cells. They are oval or round, but often have irregular nuclear contours. And again, immunohistochemistry can be very helpful in confirming the diagnosis. Remember, normal lymphocytes, B cells, T cells, most primary lymphomas are bone, are composed of cells that differentiate along the lines of B cells. They tend to be large, so they're diffuse, large B cell lymphomas. Okay, the, the youngest group of round cell tumors, and these are the benign round cell tumor, is eosinophilic granuloma, or the Langerhans histiocyte. Um, EG, when it becomes in multiple bones, is known as Hans Schuller Christian syndrome in the young children, and the most uh, malignant form of this is the litter seaweed syndrome, which you see uh, usually before the age of one. So, uh, eosinophilic granuloma, it's interesting, it changes over time in that um, when you see below the age of 20, 21, which is the majority of the EGs, that you see a kind of equal distribution of male females. Um, as you see it in, in the older pa patients above the age of 21, um, it becomes much more common in the males uh, than the females. Um, the Hans Schuller Christian and letter C, where you can see the hepatosplenomegaly, it's much more aggressive when you have the Hans Schuller Christian and the letter C. In fact, um, usually the patients will succumb to this disease. The radiologic features of EG, the most specific one, because EG in the long bones can be the, the mimicker, but in the spine, you get this vertebral plane, and it's very diagnostic of an eosinophilic uh, granuloma. When you see it in the long bones, um, it can have many different radiographic appearances. Um, it can occur in the metaphysis, the diaphysis, and epiphysis. It's interesting, it's in the diaphysis more commonly occurs in the adults. To me, this is the more common, if there's a common presentation of the um, EG. As you can see, this uh, geographic lesion, usually it's a uh, 2A lesion, meaning it has a wide zone of transition there. You can see this complete periosteal reaction over this area, and you can see some edema on the um, T, T2 weighted images. You see bone edema surrounding the EG. One of the other things is, I think it almost gives the flame sign here um, that you see it comes up in an angle as it's growing up the cortex of the bone. So the histologic features? I'll show you the histologic features. There we go. <laughs> That's even better. There you go. Remember, eosinophil granuloma is a neoplastic proliferation of Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells are not macrophages or histiocytes. They're really dendritic cells. Dendritic cells, normal dendritic cells, are antigen-presenting cells. So say they have an antigen. They mm. present it to T and B cells, which then react to it. Normal dendritic cells are found in the skin, lining our mucosal surfaces, as well as lymph nodes. So in this instance, again, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, neoplastic proliferation of the Langerhans cell dendritic cell. Characteristics in eosinophil granuloma, these cells are arranged in groups or clusters, mimicking a granuloma. That's why part of the name 
is granuloma. And the other uh, prominent aspect is usually there is a secondary population of non-neoplastic eosinophils. So the Langerhan cells are producing cytokines that are chemotactic for uh, the ingrowth of eosinophils. Some interesting cytologic features of Langerhan cells, large nuclei, again, that are hyperlobated and have nuclear clefts. In their cytoplasm, they have what's known as Beerbeck granules, which are uh, membrane-bound membrane structures which can look like tennis rackets uh, or tennis racket-like structures found only in Langerhans cells. So generally, you can make the diagnosis with light microscopy supplemented with immunohistochemistry because these cells have a specific immunoprofile. If you have the luxury of doing electron microscopy, you can see those structures within the cytoplasm of the cells. So in general, we do not operate on these if we know ahead of time. Generally, we operate on these things because we don't know what they are, and they're getting surgery, and at the time of biopsy, you end up curating these things out. However, many times, if I can make a diagnosis with a needle biopsy, I'll just inject the tumor with steroids um, or do pure PO steroids. seems to be an effective management of this disease. If you have Hans Schuller Christian, meaning thrombocytopenia and hepatosplenomegaly, it becomes very difficult to manage. You just treat it with aggressively with chemotherapy, but about 90%, 95% of these patients will die of their disease. So it's a very challenging um, treatment of the Hans Schuller Christian or the EG. So that's one more session of this marathon. So that ends the round cell, and we will try to get through and see if everybody can survive the five Let me throw out an idea. You want to wake people up with showing some, a couple unknowns? We could do that. You know, we could do some unknowns and have discussions rather than the fibrohistocytic because that's a rather boring subject that you guys probably know pretty well. Yes, I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. No, certainly even like with the paraosteal osteosarcomas, uh, 10 to 20 percent of the tumors can show infiltration of the medullary cavity, though it's usually very limited and very focal. Yeah, well, uh, to be honest with you, I don't use a cutoff. The, what I use is looking at the imaging studies or the growth specimen to get a sense where did the tumor arise with regards to its location. It arise on the surface of the or in the medullary cavity. And then using that in conjunction with the histology to, be, to make the definitive diagnosis. So I would say this, the vast majority of the surface osteosarcoma don't show medullary invasion. When they do, it's very limited. So they, they all qualify for activating part of our decisions. So we, we, I mean, there's a difference between a paraosteal and periosteal, right? Yep, the paraosteal one, the common So if one. you don't want the paraosteal, I look very, very closely at my CAT scan and my MRI scan. Uh, we debated this with a group of physicians at the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society, and uh, the majority of us, if there's no intramedullary involvement, we're going to do a hemicortical resection. Some people believe that all these paraosteals need to have a complete resection, which I don't believe, um, but some of them think you ought to have a whole distal film resection for a posterior uh, uh, paraosteal osteosarcoma in the posterior aspect of the distal femur. Even if I see medullary involvement, it depends on how much medullary involvement there is. If it's just a small 10% of the medullary canal taken up, I will still do a hemicortical resection of the. Many times, when let's say if I, I see a paraosteal and I think the MRI scan shows a higher grade component, I will probably resect that because it becomes difficult to do a biopsy of a posterior distal femoral lesion without contaminating something. So I would probably do adjuvant chemotherapy because I've already resected the distal femur if I'm making the diagnosis because there's a high grade component within it. So a lot depends on the experience, what we really believe in that radiographic appearance. I would say the majority of paraosteals I see um, I'm going to do a hemicortical resection. But you guys probably see a lot more paraosteals than I do with the volume that you're seeing, so it might be interesting what your perspective is. And, and what about periosteal? So periosteal, you would invariably do a hemicortical. I always do 
Well, there's nothing that's 100% medicine, but yeah. for the most part, I, I always do a resection, a hemicortical with periosteal. Because they, they tend to be more high grade than a the parosteal. They might be higher grade, but they rarely have intramedullary involvement. And there's no evidence out there to support that a more aggressive surgery changes the survival in that disease. So in such cases, what is the recurrence rate? What's that? Recurrence. What's your recurrence rate? What? What's your recurrence rate doing that? Oh, recurrence rate. Rate. So, Hemicortical you know, resection, you have done the reconstruction after that. So if you look at, uh, our, and we, we've looked at our surface osteosarcoma, all of our local recurrence rate is under 10%. So we've, we've not, uh, I'm probably very, very aggressive in uh, being more of a marginal surgeon. I think I'm a marginal surgeon, meaning that I don't think that the surgery has a big outcome in most of these diseases. I think that you got to get clear margins, and however you get clear margins, you're safe. But I don't think a wider margin in periosteal periosteal really makes a big difference in the survival. The first thing is, is that there is no evidence anywhere that chemotherapy makes a difference in this disease, periosteal or periosteal. So I don't think it matters whether you do a biopsy or you resect them from the beginning because we don't know if chemotherapy is going to help in this disease anyway. So it might be better to have the whole tumor out and consider your adjuvant chemotherapy. So I think a lot of this decision making, we know a periosteal or periosteal, we know they're malignant tumors radiographically. We don't even need a biopsy for that. So I think most of the time, we probably ought to just be resecting these things and not worry about the biopsy because there's no neoadjuvant treatment that really makes a difference. And I'll see what your opinion is. So, but the, to answer the question is the cartilaginous component in a periosteal osteosarcoma looks like a benign cartilage, looks very similar to the cartilage cap in an osteochondroma whereas the cartilaginous component in a periosteal osteosarc looks like a grade two chondrosarcoma. So much more cellular, much more cytologic atypia. Yeah, the second question is, are all periosteal osteosarcomas the same? Because we've seen some of them uh, uh, behave very aggressively and some of them are very low grade. So is there a group saying that there is, there is something which is uh, low grade periosteal I versus a higher grade periosteal? Uh, you can give the, the uh, pathology. I'm not aware I of clinically. any histologic low-grade periosteal osteosarc, sort of either thick of the entire uh, face of the tumor. I will frequently Xerox that and ask the resident to block out or to map where they're taking the sections from from that slab. So if, if this is the tumor, I have a central slab. Then the two hemispheres of tumor left we cut perpendicular to the long axis, put a section per sonometer of each of the diaphyseal area of the distal femur. Uh, the zone of transition is uh, wide. Uh, I can see some amorphous bone forming matrix here. Uh, I can see some, perhaps, the tumor is attempting to infiltrate through the cortex here. I can see some thinning of the cortex. Uh, I'm unsure of where the tumor is ending proximally. Distally, the tumor seems to be ending here. And I would like to think of this as an aggressive neoplasm. Okay, so the first thing is, what bone pattern do you see here? Is this a moth-eaten, permeative, permeative. Is geographic? Permeative. Permeative, okay. So I, I would buy in that. So I think this is somewhere between a moth eaten and permeative. You remember, bone tumors don't always fall into one complete category, you know? People are like, oh, well, I think it's permeative. Well, I think it's moth eaten. Well, you know, some of it's moth eaten, some of it's permeative. So <laughs> this is an aggressive pattern. So this is what we would say is a class three lesion. So what's the probability of this being malignant? It's a higher probability of it being Yeah, so malignant. it's greater than 90% chance of being malignant, okay? Yes. All right, so let's switch over to periosteum. What do you see in the periosteum here? And let me see if this helps you out any. Mm, I that's so probably see, better. So I see some break, some attempt at the tumor trying to permeate through the cortex here. I can see the cortex thinning. Mm -hmm. I can't appreciate an obvious uh, periosteal elevation or a reaction on this radiograph. But on the lateral, I think I saw some attempt at, that's a periosteal reaction for me here. Right. 
So certainly concerning that this thing is potentially breaking through the cortex, but at least with this plain film, I can't for sure say a periostal reaction is going on. All right, so what other clues that are going on? So we've gone through bone pattern we think is uh, looking like a malignancy. The periostal reaction, it looks like it's a break in the cortex, so potentially a soft tissue mass, right? So that's again going towards uh, an aggressive more aggressive lesion. Neoplasm. All right, so what type of clues are we seeing in here? So you're talking to me, is there any clues on this information narrowing down more than just malignant, what type of malignancy there is? Well, so because it's a permeative neoplasm, uh, I would think more in terms of a, a round cell tumor, uh, okay. a round cell neoplasm. So would I be able to know the age of this patient? So it's a 20 year old. If it's a 20 year old individual, I would highly suspect uh, that perhaps I'm dealing with an Ewing's sarcoma because it's a permeative neoplasm. Okay. And uh, that would be my top differential. So I love that you get the age in there because age is so important. If somebody would have told you this is an 80 year old, you wouldn't be thinking Ewing sarcoma, yes. right? Yes. Or osteosarcoma yes. for that factor. Maybe it's a chondrosarcoma or something like that. But it's a 20 year old, you immediately narrow down your differential, yes. which is so important. That's why when we talk about reading x-rays, it's not just about reading that x-ray, it's that clinical information. What's the age of that patient? When you put the age in there, all of a sudden your differential really narrows down. And then if I tell you the patient's had bone pain for three months, well, you know, now this is clinically uh, like a malignant tumor, tumor, right? So that information is very, very important. So what we're seeing here, what do you think this is here? Well, well, so I would call that an amorphous uh, bone forming matrix. So maybe some mineralization there, right? Yes. So if it's mineralization, probably less likely Ewing's, right? Yes, more likely an osteo. So, so, uh, so, so although I would say that a large percentage of Ewing sarcoma would also give rise to... I think you certainly can keep Ewing's in there, you have to, but I think osteosarcoma might be a little bit higher with that mineralization pattern, because you can see Ewing sometimes gets some mineralization within it. Go ahead. Soft tissue as well. So soft tissue is yeah. an important thing, and that's what we're getting... So what do you see in that soft tissue there? We talked about periosteal reaction, but look at the soft tissue closely. What do you see? So I can see some attempt at bone formation here. So certainly there's a lump right there, isn't there? Yes. Okay. And yeah. so even though you don't see a periosteal reaction, if the, if the tumor breaks quickly through the cortex, the periosteal doesn't have a chance to lift up. It lift just up. breaks through it, right? So many times, if this is a malignant tumor and you give chemotherapy, all of a sudden the Codman's angle forms because the, you start treating the tumor and start killing things off. But right now, you can definitely see a soft tissue mass associated with this lesion right here, right? Yes. So with what probability do you think this is a malignant lesion? So if I were to If bet, you're a betting I, man, what yeah. would you bet? I would bet that this is a malignant lesion. Yeah, like, would you bet at all, bet the house? No. Oh, I bet the house. <laughs> that, that's... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so at this point, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of additional um, information that was given. It's not the test I would normally order, but this is a fancy x-ray and the patient came worked up, so I'll give you this fancy x-ray called a CT scan. All right, so what do you see there? So it reinforces most of the findings uh, that were evident on the x-ray. Although I can appreciate the mineralization in the matrix more, I can appreciate an extensive cortical disruption so much more than what I would appreciate on the x-ray. Right? Yes. That's a bad thing, right? Yes. And I, I see an obvious what's this? angle here. That's a Codman's angle. angle it's not completely Codman's formed right here. now. But you can see that's periosteum has been elevated up. Yes. It's elevated really quickly. So you don't have that tearing of the periosteum all the way up of that the, uh, cortex there. And right? I can see that even on the lateral view. Yep. So you can see a periosteal reaction over there too. So what do you see in the middle here, this stuff here? Well, I see more of bone formation in the matrix. So obviously there's some bone formation, and here's the axial of that, and you can see some more bone formation. Some more bone formation. So what do you think now? You think this thing's a Ewing sarcoma? I would think 
more now for an osteosarcoma? Very good. Obviously, you get some bone formation. It's a 20-year-old patient, so I'm certainly favoring an osteosarcoma. So what would be your next staging studies that you would have gotten other than a CAT scan? Sorry, the next study? Yes, what study would you have ordered? I would have ordered an MRI. There you go. Absolutely, that's what I would have ordered too. So what do you see on the MRI scan? On the MRI, I see a significantly bigger soft tissue component than I did appreciate on the CT scan. And I see as much of a soft tissue component as I see an intraosseous component. Uh, I don't see frank permeation through this cortex here. I see a big breakthrough in this cortex. I see periosteal elevation on both sides. I see adjacent edema in the soft tissue. Is that bad? And uh, is, is on, peritumoral on, on, edema bad? Sorry? Is peritumoral edema bad? It is bad. Yes. Yes, it is bad. So it is it's suggestive not of aggression. always a malignancy, but certainly favors a malignancy when you see peritumoral edema, right? So what is that peritumoral edema? Dr. Anaking, what did he tell you that was? If you well, was... peritumoral edema would suggest that, that pseudocapsule where the tumor is trying to penetrate through. It's actually the... that inflammatory zone, yes. right? So yes, yes. Inflammatory have... zone between the normal uh, tissue right. and the tumor. And so that, that inflammatory zone is important because we know there's satellite cells in that inflammatory yes. zone, right? And so, it's so certainly peritumoral edema, you're concerned about it. You've read that MRI scan perfectly. But what do you really need in an MRI scan? What, what, is that enough of the MRI scan to see? Is that so if you're ordering the MRI scan, how do you want that thing done as far as do you see just, just where the tumor is or you need to see more of the bone? No, I would like to see more of the bone. I would like to see the entire section. Right. So you've got to see the whole skip compartment, medicine, right? Skip, skip lesions in the bone. Absolutely. I would so like to see if the joint is involved or not. So and yes, so what there do was you an think effusion here? around the patella. So it does reinforce uh, the earlier findings. And I see an extensive edema even in the marrow here. I see the edema going all the way across till here. So there this is no is interesting. Obvious this is... What do you see here? That's the periosteum, right? Yes, that's where it's ending. That's periosteum. The and so what is angle. this here? That's not periosteum that's elevated up. That's yes, the it's peritumoral edema. edema. Peritumoral edema. And so you can see that disappears with contrast enhanced image. Mm -hmm. At least most of it does. Mm -hmm. Right? What else do you see with that contrast enhanced image? Well, I see a lot of these necrotic areas which are not picking up contrast. Good. And I see... Is necrosis bad? Is ne necrosis is definitely bad. Are you ready to bet the house yet? Well, uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> I'm coming close to it now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So your differential right now is what? My differential right now is uh, osteosarcoma. And number two? Ewing sarcoma. Osteosarcoma. Three osteosarcoma. Yeah. I think this is an osteosarcoma. Yes. You know, yes my yes. differential one, two, and three is going to be an osteosarcoma. osteosarcoma. All right. So at this stage, what do you want to do next? You ready to... to chop his leg off, do an amputation? Well, no. Right now, I would first like to confirm. I would like to do a biopsy. Okay. And uh, I would How are you going to do that biopsy? You're going to do an incisional biopsy? No, I would like to do a core needle biopsy. Core needle biopsy, yes. good. And I would like to do the core needle biopsy medially through the soft tissue component in the midline medially. Absolutely. And uh, I would stay away from the joint. And I would like to take my sample from this soft tissue component. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, you've done that now. You're right on the money. That, that's what you got. And, and right now, Dr. Rosenberg is yes. not in town, so you're going to have to read it. So, so I see a cellular lesion. I see pleomorphism. I see a, a lot of uh, hyperchromatic nuclei. Uh, I see a lot of uh, malignant osteoid. And I, I would think this is an osteosarcoma. I, low grade or high grade? I would think this is high grade. I agree. Yeah, so it was, it was great read. So this is, looks like a high grade osteosarcoma. So what do you want to do next? Well, now I would like to work him up. Uh, and for, what would you do for that? Uh, I would like to do a CT thorax and a bone scan, or if the patient's affording, I would like to do a PET CT combined with a breath hold CT thorax. So there you go. So um, with our care in the United States, we can't do PET scans for sarcoma. So you're going to get a CT scan and All a right. total body bone scan. And I think we should, but I'm not convinced anybody of that yet. 
All right, so there's your bone scan. So does he have metastasis down here in the tibia? So it's, it's, it's the uptake here is almost equal to that I see here. And what do you uh, see down here? Yeah, I can see some uptake down here too. So but what's, sir, what's going on there? So I'm not... Uh, so you have multicentric osteosarcoma? Well, sir, on this bone scan with uh, one leg that's inflamed, we see a lot of reactive uh, right. updates this, that's this is shown just on bone changes. scan and because right. it's a sensitive uh, imaging Absolutely. modality. So I wouldn't uh, so, yeah. think so this is medicine. He has an isolated bone metastasis and the CT scan of the lungs is clear. Yes. So what would you do next? Well, now I would like to counsel him that he would need a new adjuvant chemotherapy. Right. Uh, we would like to restage him at the end of uh, two cycles. and. Uh, we would give him upfront chemo, restage him, and then offer him limb salvage surgery. So you give two cycles of chemotherapy? Yes, for we routinely give two cycles of adriamycin, cisplatin, and methotrexate-based chemotherapy. Good. And then uh, restage them at the end of two full cycles. Right. And then go ahead with a uh, repeat uh, of the local MRI. Uh, again, if the patient's affording, we would like to do a response evaluation, PET CT scan to gauge uh, local response as a surrogate marker before we have the final necrosis evaluation. And we would then go ahead with limb salvage surgery. So I agree with everything you said. It's beautiful. The only difference that we would do in the US is we give three cycles of chemotherapy for bone right. sarcomas. So, um, uh, but anyways, that, that's right on the money. And then what would you do for surgery? Pardon, sir? What would you do for surgery? Well, for surgery, we would like to do uh, a distal femoral resection, which would be through the joint, and we would like to do an endoprosthetic uh, replacement, uh, and uh, that's what we would okay. be doing. No, I, I agree. I, what do you think about? Was there tumor involved with the joint on this thing or not? Well, uh, no. On, on the on the MR, I didn't think the joint was involved. Uh, although on the earlier section, I saw some effusion around the patella in the patellofemoral joint on one of the eggshell sections that was shown. Uh, but on this section, I see, I don't see much edema on this, but I see some contrast being taken up here. But the joint does not show any effusion. So would anybody do a, uh, an extra-articular resection here, or would you do an intra-articular resection? I would resection? do an intra-articular resection here. Anybody doing different? I, I would uh, see the cross-sections. Yes. Yeah. That, that's exactly what the cruciate. So this was not uh, involved uh, intra-articular, hmm. but the cruciates I think is key because, hmm. and, and I'll let Andrew put his point on this, I rarely ever see intra-articular invasion coming out from the posterior capsule or sup the patellar pouch. The cruciate ligaments are the only things that I think I actually see tumor coming down that ligaments. And I think you rarely get intra-articular involvement with osteosarcoma. But I, I don't know what your opinion is. You've reviewed more of the pathology on these things. Can you repeat the question? Last case, because everybody's tired, but this one's going to be, yes? What would you have done if there was extension? Oh, I would have done an extra-articular resection. The thing about it is, is that I, I reviewed all of... Uh, ...of a patient that is 55 years old, and is complaining of some hip pain. The pain has um, just been coming on over the last two or three months, dull, continuous aching pain. What do you see? Sorry, on the lateral cortex. Uh, I see that the extent of the mineralization is based on the criteria that we learned today, less than 50% of what I see. Uh, I don't see any obvious thickening of cortex. I only see scalloping on the lateral cortex. I don't see any obvious cortical breakthrough, although I'm worried that the cortex has an impending break here. I don't see any obvious extraosseous soft tissue component. And I'm unsure of uh, the margins, both proximally as well as distally. So I think the zone of transition here is wide. And everything is in suggestion that this is an aggressive uh, chondroid neoplasm. OK. So that's what I was going to say. Bony, You've probably yeah. seen more patients than I've already seen in my lifetime. Mm. And so the normal structure of that proximal femur, is that looking like the normal 
So I, I would say this segment here seems expanded. Right, so there's expansion. Yeah. So expansion, to me, that's a very, very worrisome sign. I don't think benign cartilage tumors will expand the bone, okay? Yes. So I think that's very, very worrisome. And I think that scalloping is probably grade three scalloping. Yes. So if you go through the Letson criteria here, right? Yeah. So we got grade three, three scalloping, scalloping. Less than 50% mineralization, less than bony expansion. And it's highly likely that it's... And then the bone scan. Higher than the ASIs. So this is, would you bet your house yet? Yeah, I would. Yeah, so I think this is a chondrosarcoma, yes. right? All right, so here's your MRI scan. Is that consistent with what you're thinking? Uh, so yes, it is. It's a lobular tumor. There's chondroid matrix. Yeah, lobular tumor. I mean, that cartilage tumor lobulates when it grows. That's uh, just Can you go...